Good morning, and welcome once again to Christ Church Selbridge on this, the fifth Sunday before Advent. But I suppose the more significant uh, date and time in our minds is the beginning of yet uh, another uh, lockdown in our country as we try to deal with the scourge of the coronavirus. And our thoughts and our prayers this day as we worship are with all those who are struggling with the consequences of this situation. And we think especially uh, of those uh, who are at home and housebound uh, and those who are living alone and separated from their loved ones at this time. The theme of our gospel reading is the love command uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And love is what holds us together and what binds us together and what strengthens us uh, in times like this. And that will be the theme of our service as we celebrate the love that we first knew when God created us and continues to sustain us uh, through the gift of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the Spirit at work in us today. And so our opening hymn for this service of Holy Communion Love is his word.
Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and also with you. And now we call to mind those ways in which we have fallen short of God's will for our lives as we confess our sins. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the collect for the day. O God, whose Son has taught us that love is the fulfillment of your law, stir up within us the fire of your Holy Spirit and pour into our hearts your greatest gift of love so that we may love you with our whole being and our neighbours as ourselves. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 1 to 12. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev and the plain, that is, the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. The Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigour had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses had ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. And the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord sent, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequalled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land, and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is taken from 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully maltreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or a pure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed. 
nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse, tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also of our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. This is the word of the Lord. The gradual hymn, My Song is Love Unknown. Saviour Christ, according to St. Matthew, chapter 22, beginning at verse 34. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the Spirit called him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put my enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to answer, give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. 
This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is the most straightforward and unambiguous teaching we ever hear from Jesus. It's not couched in parable or story. It's not laced with symbolism or image. It is completely black and white. It is fundamental to the gospel. The word fundamental or its derivative fundamentalist has got a bad press in recent times, conjuring up images perhaps of street preachers waving placards forecasting the end of time and condemning people for their sinful ways, or on the other hand, religious extremists committing atrocities uh, supposedly in the name of God. There is a real need to reclaim the word fundamentalist and fundamentalism. It is a very positive thing, in fact. It is about going back to the fundamentals of our faith, back to basics, in a way that is very much in harmony with the fundamental teaching of Jesus, as outlined in the command to love one another. If we're that kind of fundamentalist, then the world would be a better place. But back to love. It's not always easy to love in a world that is increasingly sceptical and untrusting, a world that can appear to have less time for the message of the gospel, often indeed because of that misrepresentation of fundamentalism. The contemporary theologian Philip Yancey, in his book Vanishing Grace, observes that it is very difficult to act as salt and yeast in a society that views Christianity so negatively. He also notes the irony in the fact that so many of the values and causes espoused in our world today, such as human rights, education, democracy, and compassion for the weak, actually stem from the Christian tradition and Christian roots. And yet, the church today is very often dismissed as anathema to these same principles. We're seen not as dispensers of grace, but rather dispensers of guilt. But could it be different? I think it could. I think if we find a way to share afresh the fundamental message of the gospel in a fresh and positive manner, things could be very different. But it is back to basics. There's no denying that the world desires love. The Beatles sang about it, and doctors, and psychiatrists, and sociologists, and representatives of virtually every religion are agreed that human beings need to be loved. The problem for us as church is how we love. The key phrase is this, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Is this really how we love? Do we really put ourselves in the shoes of the other person? Do we attempt to understand other people when we relate to them, or do we simply see them as the other who is wrong, and we who are right. It's easy to love those who are like us, but so much more challenging to love those who are different. In the same book, Philip Yancey notes Rabbi Jonathan Sachs' observation that the Old Testament in one instance issues the command to love your neighbour as yourself, but on 36 occasions commands us to love the stranger. The challenge he identifies in the light of this is to see God's image in one who is not in our image. And this kind of love is actually grace. Because it is love that on the face of it is undeserved. The same love that God has shown to us, not love that can be earned or bought by any financial transaction, but love that is freely given and most graphically demonstrated in the cross. God loves us not simply for who we are, but also for who we can become. And that indeed is what resurrection is all about. God loves us into our best selves. Love itself drives goodness and righteousness. It's not a reward, 
but it is a vital building block in building the kingdom of heaven. A word that is often associated with uh, love is mission. The two need to go together. Mission is at the heart of the gospel and is not just about far off lands but it's about what's happening in our own parish and community. Everywhere that humanity uh, exists and indeed where there is creation there is mission. Mission calls us to be more simply than passive members of the church, but rather something much more active and demanding, disciples, disciples of Jesus. And that carries with it an imperative to reach out and to share the good news, not in an aggressive uh, manner. We have a gospel to proclaim, certainly, a treasure to share, but we need to be cautious in assuming that we have a monopoly on that gospel And this is linked directly with how we love. Love is a two-way relationship. And if we assume that we're doing all the giving, then our relationships will be dysfunctional and unbalanced. Yancey tells a a lovely story of a hospice chaplain called Susan who describes the pattern of her ministry. And I think it really illustrates what I've been uh, trying to say in my ramblings. When she enters a room, Susan assumes that, bidden or not, God is already present. We love because he first loved us, she says, quoting John. And I picture God pouring from his pitcher into me so that I can pour out to others and then be replenished with God's love. I enter with a smile, feeling privileged to share the sacred ground on which someone clings to life. If I forget that God goes ahead of me and think instead that I am bringing God into the room, I can have an air of smugness. I feel pressure to say the right thing, try to impress the patient and staff. In short, I take myself too seriously. I need the constant reminder that God precedes me in that room and that the person in the bed has a story that I can learn from. That pattern of ministry is one which we could very fruitfully apply to how we show love as a church in the world. We need to think so much more about the other than ourselves. As Susan said, not to take ourselves uh, too seriously. A church that is aware of its own lack as well as its own riches, is a church much better equipped to share the good news and to love our neighbour as ourself. Perhaps we can use this time that we find ourselves in, this time of withdrawal and shelter, to think again about how we relate as church to the world, to rediscover the humility that allows us to receive from others and to see and experience God's blessing in the other, the stranger, the one perhaps in whom we would be most unlikely to seek it. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we affirm our faith together. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the Church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. We come before God who is our shelter and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. We pray for our communities. Loving God, we bring before you the needs of our brothers and sisters. Help us to love you with all our hearts and minds, and to love our neighbours as ourselves. With these commandments before us, we pray for the elderly and lonely, 
confined to their homes, separated from family and support. For children, as they are out of school on holidays. For those who have lost or may lose their source of income. For those who fear they may lose their home. And we give thanks for those who are helping and sharing and offering everyday kindness so that nobody is left out. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for key workers, for all medical staff and hospital and nursing home workers who go to work to care for others, knowing the risks they face. For medical researchers seeking ways to prevent and cure, for social workers protecting the vulnerable, for care workers providing contact and support to those who have no other help. For teachers helping young people to get back to learning in unusual times. For farmers, shop workers and delivery drivers keeping the country provisioned. For cleaners fighting the spread of infection and for those we have not mentioned but who work for the good of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for our families and friends. Thank you for the technology that enables us to keep in touch, even when separated by a great distance. Thank you for our church family and that we can share in worship together as we are today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our world, for the leaders as they work to find ways to deal with the pandemic. We pray for our own government, that they will have wisdom to know how to navigate and to lead us in a way that we can trust. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are sick, for any who are afflicted with coronavirus, for those with other illnesses and conditions which leave them vulnerable, for those suffering poor mental health, and for those who have fallen and hurt themselves. For all who are ill and who suffer. And in a moment's silence, we bring before God any known to us who are not well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church, for all bishops and clergy and all in their care, for hospital and hospice chaplains as they minister to the sick and dying. In our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the parish of Talla and the clergy William Deverell and Avril Bennett. We also pray for the Dublin University Far Eastern Mission. And finally, we pray for our rector Stephen and his family as he ministers to us in this parish. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As Jesus was moved to tears at the grave of his friend Lazarus, we ask that you would look with compassion on those who are bereaved and grieving the loss of a loved one. Give to their troubled and broken hearts the light of hope and bring them your comfort in their sorrow. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we begin a new week, grant us the grace to work together with honest and faithful hearts, each caring for the good of all. And we finish by saying, Merciful Father, accept these our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. And we share peace uh, with each other in our own homes and communities and pray peace for each other as we are separated, perhaps uh, physically, but together in spirit as we come together around the table of the Lord. The hymn of the 
offertory is let us break bread together. We are one. Let us break bread together. Gracious God, you spread a table before us. Nourish your people with the word of life and the bread of heaven. Amen. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Father almighty and ever-living God at all times and in all places, it is right to give you thanks and praise. And so with all your people, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name forever, praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, Father, the creator and sustainer of all things. You made us in your own image, male and female. You created us. Even when we turned away from you, you never ceased to care for us. But in your love and mercy, you freed us from the slavery of sin, giving your only begotten Son to become man and suffer death on the cross to redeem us. He made there the one complete and all-sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks to you, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, with this bread and this cup, we do as Christ your Son commanded. We remember his passion and death. We celebrate his resurrection and ascension, and we look for the coming of his kingdom. Accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts, grant by the power of the life-giving Spirit, that we may be made one in your holy church and partakers of the body and blood of your Son, that he may dwell in us and we in him. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. And as our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. We being many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Remember that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts, by faith, with thanksgiving. And we pray together, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Our final hymn this morning, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.